let me share with you how I first went to East Africa uh, to teach pastors. Uh, I had pastored uh, one congregation in Roanoke, Virginia for 28 years and then made the decision to step down from that ministry and not continue uh, in that church. And uh, it was a difficult time, particularly for my, wi- for my wife, because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. She would look at me and say, Randy, what do you want to do? Well, I'm not sure, dear. Uh, I know I want to serve the Lord. I want to minister His Word. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how uh, that's going to happen. And uh, then the Lord placed me in uh, a small congregation in the inner city. I had been evangelizing in the inner city of Roanoke, Virginia, for several years. And uh, I believe I can say honestly that it was coming to know uh, our brother Tim Conway and having the joy of seeing the ministry there in San Antonio uh, in the inner city. It was through that uh, wonderful experience that the Lord birthed in my heart a desire to do that kind of thing. And so I had started making evangelistic efforts in our inner city for several years. And um, when I stepped down from that congregation, a well-established congregation, uh, the leaders of that church said to me, uh, Pastor, go ahead and make an effort in the city. Try to start a church in the inner city. And uh, at that time, I got to know an African-American brother who had planted a church in the inner city And uh, I came to respect him to the extent that I did not want to start something that might be a discouragement to him and his small congregation. Um, And uh, so I backed away, not sure what I was going to do. And then a few months after that, the Lord called that African-American brother away, sent him to another city in Virginia. And uh, he approached me and said, any possibility that you would be interested in stepping into leadership uh, with this tiny group of people that I pastor. And we spent time talking, and I got to know the people, and that small number of people called me to be, to be the pastor of All Nations Church. Well, <clears throat> at, um, at that same time, or shortly into that effort, uh, a friend of mine in Roanoke, uh, a pastor friend by the name of Tim Martin, called me and said, hey, Randy, I'm scheduled to go to Uganda to teach in some pastor's conferences over there. And an elder in the church was was supposed to go with me. And he's had to bow out because of work pressures. And I'm calling to ask if there's any possibility that you'd like to go along as a substitute uh, for a couple of weeks. And uh, I said, well, I think perhaps I would. And talked to my wife, uh, had a discussion with uh, the small congregation uh, that I was now pastoring, and everyone agreed, yes, you should go. So uh, in, um, in 2000, uh, excuse me, 2010, yes, late 2010, took off to Uganda with this brother, and uh, we taught in three different places over those two weeks. Uh, Something significant was happening during those two weeks. I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, This other pastor who had invited me, he's now my pastor because my wife and I have now joined the church where he ministers. Uh, But Pastor Tim Martin was counting the days till he could get back home. Uh, He missed his wife and missed his children. And I missed my wife, of course. But I was kind of dreading coming back. I was enjoying it so much. I was counting the days until I would have to get on the plane and return. And uh, came back, kept on pastoring that little church in the city. Uh, Early 2011, made another trip uh, to, um, uh, pardon me, uh, Lusaka, Lusaka, forgive me. Lusaka is the capital of, you know, where Conrad Mbewe is. Oh, come on, Randy. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing up. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, Zambia, yes. Uh, Lusaka, Zambia. Went, went there to teach. Went back to Uganda to teach again. 
there uh, and then made another teaching trip to Uganda uh, in uh, September of 2011. And when I came back from that third trip, I said to my wife, this is what I want to do with the remaining healthy, fruitful years that I trust the Lord will give me. And uh, so I began to make plans to step down from my pastoral role of that small congregation. There was a very gifted young man uh, in the church who was proving himself a leader and a very effective preacher. His name is Charlie Evans. And uh, I began to concentrate on Charlie becoming the pastor of the church. He was already ministering regularly from the pulpit. And uh, we began to plan for his ordination and for his assuming pastoral leadership. And we carried that out in early 2012. And uh, I told the congregation, look, when we, when we, have, his, when we uh, have his ordination, that's also his installation. Uh, if, if we ordain him, uh, then he becomes your pastor. We won't have two services. We'll just combine it and get it over with. And uh, so Charlie Evans became the pastor of All Nations Church in January 2012. And I, at the same time, um, was made uh, a member of or was connected to this organization called Equipping Pastors International it sounds, you know, huge, you know, equipping pastors international. Well, there's about five of us <laughs> who travel around the world trying to teach pastors. It's not uh, impressive at all, but uh, I'm thankful for the people uh, that are part of that and um, have been such a help to me. Well, let me, gi- let me give you a statistic. Um, I learned this from Operation World. You know Operation World, kind of the Bible of modern missions statistics, I suppose. But if you think of sub-Sahara Africa, now that's everything below the Muslim world. East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, South Africa, or Southern Africa. If you think of all of that vast part of the world, the evangelical community, that is everyone who says Jesus is the only Savior, the Bible is God's Word, you have to be born again to go to heaven, and if you don't know Jesus, and you're not ready to go to heaven through Him, you go to hell. And this message about Jesus needs to be told everywhere. Okay? And that's a very broad definition. But take everyone that believes that. Every kind of church that believes that. Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Wesleyan, Lutheran, on down the line. Independent churches. If you look at all the churches that believe that in sub-Saharan Africa, that community grows, it increases by about 200,000 people every 10 days. Now maybe you thought I was going to say months or weeks, but every 10 days that community has huge numbers of people who are hearing some kind of presentation of the gospel and making some kind of response. Now, I'm not suggesting, and I don't think Operation World is suggesting, that that many people are genuinely converted. If there were 200,000 Africans genuinely converted every 10 days, then the gospel would dominate Africa uh, in about two years, And we'd be having missionaries from Africa showing up here in Laredo. And everybody in Laredo would know the gospel within another two years. It would be phenomenal. So it doesn't mean that many people are genuinely converted. I'm only saying that huge numbers of people are hearing some kind of presentation of the gospel. And often it's blended in with health and wealth. Okay, I'm not saying this is pure, healthy gospel preaching. It's blended in with other errors. 
But huge numbers of people listening, huge numbers of people responding in some way. Now, here's the part of the statistic that is significant for what I'm doing. 90% of those people who make some kind of profession will go into churches where pastors have no training. I'm not talking about little training. I'm talking about no training. So what that means is that huge numbers of people are making a response to some kind of presentation of the gospel, and then they go into churches where there's no one to really teach them. So how does that translate in my heart and mind? Well, it translates in my heart and mind in a very obvious way. There is great need for pastoral training all across sub-Sahara Africa. And so the Lord has been giving me opportunities in five countries, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is in the center of the continent and is a part not of East Africa, but of Central Africa. The Democratic Republic of Congo is a huge, huge country. You don't really get a sense of the size of it looking at most uh, world maps. Uh, proportionally, it's much larger than it appears uh, to be on that world map. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a few moments uh, how the Lord uh, first led me into the DRC. Well, uh, when I started going back to Uganda in 2012, I got to know even better a man named Martin O.D. Martin lives in a little village uh, of Nora, Uganda. His wife is Helen. Uh, they are some of the dearest friends I've ever had. I love them. They're such examples of godliness and Christ-like service uh, to me. I really count it a privilege to be their friend. Helen made her first trip to the, to the United States uh, back in January. Uh, the organization to which I'm committed, uh, which I'm connected, has one annual meeting of staff and board in Orlando. And uh, Martin came again from Uganda, and Helen for the first time came along with them. And uh, when I saw her, um, I said, Helen, tell me what is most uh, gripping your mind and your heart as you've now seen America. What, 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 what has stood out? And immediately she answered, and I wasn't at all surprised. She said, where are the people? Now, here's the reason she said that. In Africa, everywhere you go, you see people, people walking, people on bicycles, people on motorbikes. They're called bodabodas. And a few people will be in vehicles. But there aren't that many vehicles, at least out in the uh, outside of cities. And even when you're in cities, you still see Loads of people everywhere in the streets. I've been in places uh, where I was in a vehicle and uh, the driver would turn onto a street and the street would be utterly packed, is utterly packed with people. And the driver has to say, well, I can't go down that street. I'll have to go around another way. You just don't drive through uh, streets that are so packed sometimes with people. Sometimes you do and have to take it very slowly. But people are everywhere. Well, in our country, my friends, where do you see people? Well, if you go to a mall, if you go to a restaurant, you'll see, you'll see people. But in this country, most people are what? They're inside their houses and they're inside vehicles. So you don't really see people. In Africa, you see people. People are everywhere. Helen said that, that's the most startling thing about this country. Well, let me tell you about the first time I went to Rwanda. <clears throat> this was in the first year that I uh, was making more treks, uh, 2012. Martin O'Dea, my 
dear friend in Uganda. Uh, he was taking me to Rwanda. And uh, we had two conferences scheduled for pastors. And uh, when we uh, walked into a church building for the first conference, um, something very um, unusual to me uh, was uh, already set up in that meeting. There were probably about 40 or 50 pastors uh, there that day to be taught. And uh, here's, here's the way the, 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 the uh, chairs were arranged. Um, there were ch- chairs in a semicircle, uh, a number of chairs, uh, a larger number of chairs. And then in the middle of the semicircle, there were three chairs. Okay? And in those three chairs were three older men. They were well-dressed, dignified Africans, men probably in their 70s, and they were sitting in the center. And all the younger men were gathered around them. And we were supposed to teach First Timothy. And it didn't take me long to understand the body language. These older men are going to sit here, and they're going to make a judgment about what we're doing. And if these men give us this, these older men, if they give us this, maybe these younger men will listen to us. And if the older men give us this, we're toast. And we might as well go on somewhere else. It was obvious. It was just obvious. Because you see, in Africa, age is respected. I'll never forget, a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago, I have a dear friend who's a Southern Baptist pastor in my area. We would often get together for lunch. And he was about 10 years my senior. His name is Larry. And one day he said to me, Now, Randy, remember, the day's coming when you're going to get older. And when you do, you're going to be invisible. He didn't explain himself. He just said, just remember, it's going to happen, old buddy. You're going to become invisible. And it wasn't very long until my hair got whiter and whiter. And where I realized that I would walk into a mall and no one would look my way. And I remember thankfully smiling to myself and saying, well, it's happening. I'm becoming invisible. You know, I've been to some of these conferences together for the gospel, you know, the gospel coalition. I haven't been to all of them, but I've been to several of them. And a lot of young men, you know, come to these conferences, young men in their 20s, 30s. And uh, I've, I've walked around the book rooms. And uh, I'm invisible. This, this white stuff, man, you're washed up. What, what, what do you have to tell me? <laughs> In Africa, it's the opposite. You walk in with white hair, mm, may, maybe this man has something worth saying. Now, that may be, you know, one of the attractions to Africa for me now, you see. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) Well, at any rate, here we were in this church, the younger pastors gathered around these three middle chairs. And I think it was on the second day, I was teaching 1 Timothy, and I don't remember how I came uh, to say this, but I I paused at one point in the teaching, and I said, uh, you know, brothers, there are times when my own Bible reading becomes a stale and unproductive for me. I'm not really getting anything out of my Bible reading. And I said, when that happens, I usually take one of the Gospels. I'll take Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and I'll just read a Gospel for three or four days. Just meditate on one Gospel, praying that the Lord would quicken my heart. And I said, what happens is, I do find my heart refreshed and quickened to get my heart and mind back in close contact with Jesus, who he is, what he said, what he did. And I said, then I'll go back to my regular pattern. 
Well, after that session, the middleman, the oldest of the elders, the middleman, his name is Noah Mudagiri, he came to me and he took my hands like this and he said, thank you for what you shared about reading your Bible. And this man said to me, I've had that happen in my Christian life. I've had times in my life when I haven't really been getting anything out of the Bible. And he said, I've always been afraid to tell anyone. And that, that one small moment, I mean, it, it, it couldn't have been more than 90 seconds that I took to say that in the midst of teaching First Timothy. And that one brief moment opened that dear man's heart to me. And, and, and so Bishop Noah, Bishop Noah said, I've been praying for years for someone to come to Rwanda to teach pastors. And he said, you are the answer to my prayers. And I, I am I'm overwhelmed at God's kindness and mercy. And I should finish out that little bit of, of story. This man, Noah Mudagiri, has been the means, the God-ordained means, of probably three or four hundred pastors learning the gospel. I don't, mean, I don't mean simply men who heard him at a conference and said, I want to be a preacher like Bishop Noah. But I mean men who have been brought to Christ through this man's ministry in the DRC, in Burundi, and in Rwanda. And uh, God has used him in extraordinary ways. Uh, the first time I went to Burundi to teach, uh, the, the men that I was teaching in the capital city uh, some of them were not very attentive. They were not very appreciative. Uh, that occasionally happens. Uh, not usually. Usually men come with hunger and desire to learn and are receptive. But occasionally I found myself in places uh, where men walk in and, and uh, you know, they're already bishop so-and-so and they have already had some kind of they would say revelation, and God has called them to do this or that, and, and uh, you know, who's this white man uh, coming to teach us? And um, so I, I got some of that attitude in, in Burundi, and um, I left thinking, well, there are other places I can go, and, and um, other places where I think uh, men will be more receptive, and uh, I really left Burundi thinking, I'm not going back there. But Bishop Noah is deeply burdened for Burundi, and uh, he was aware of what had happened, and uh, he communicated to me later on, please, please, would you go back to Burundi? And, uh, and I said, uh, well, Bishop Noah, will you be there? Will you be there in the meetings if I go back? Yes, I will be there where you are teaching, he said. <laughs> well, I've gone back. And uh, uh, you, you remember the uh, commercial, uh, when Smith Barney speaks, people listen? Do you remember that? You don't remember that commercial? Well, Smith, you know, Smith Barney is a big um, stock company, uh, Wall Street, whatever, you know. And, and um, so the commercial has this line, when Smith Barney speaks... People listen. Well, when Bishop Noah <laughs> speaks, <laughs> people listen. <laughs> and uh, so um, I've continued in Burundi, although now, uh, please pray for Burundi, there is uh, increase of civil war. Uh, it started over a political brouhaha, but it has increased in recent months and has now morphed into a Hutu Tutsi civil war in Burundi, which is the same tribal conflict that led to the 94 genocide in Rwanda. And God forbid that that would be repeated in Burundi. But 
there is right now increasing uh, civil war violence in Burundi, and uh, the pastors there uh, have uh, said to me, Pastor Randy, it's not safe for you to come back. Uh, and in fact, I would have difficulty even getting a visa to get into the country. The, the government is, of Burundi is holding outsiders at bay. Uh, so right now the doors are closed uh, in uh, Burundi. Well, um, let me mention some other men uh, that uh, are uh, friends and are key uh, associates in the work that I'm doing. Uh, Stephen Shimimana uh, is a gifted brother uh, in Rwanda who is my favorite translator. I usually have to have translation in Rwanda. Um, uh, they have their own uh, national language, Kenya Rwandan, and uh, I wish I could get up in front of those men and start speaking fluent Kenya Rwandan, but uh, I'm not able to do that. So Stephen has become my primary translator. I'm also uh, a close friend of Theophil Rugabira uh, in Rwanda, in Kigali. Uh, Theophil is a, God, is a man that God has used in Rwanda, in the DRC, and Burundi. And uh, I count him a, a, a true friend and uh, helper. Uh, George Kariuki is the man that I'm most closely connected with in Kenya. Uh, George was a banker. He was very successful in business, uh, but felt called of God into the ministry and left his um, uh, comfortable uh, banker position and started preaching and pastoring, and God has used him. And then let me give you one uh, name. You might have seen this name at times in one of my letters, uh, I have a dear friend whose name is Upoki Bitum, and Upoki is U-P-O-K-I, Upoki, Upoki Bitum. Uh, let me tell you how I met Upoki. Uh, the Lord has given me uh, open doors at a Christian college in Kampala, Kampala, the capital of Uganda, uh, it's uh, a very fine Christian college called African Bible University. It was started and is still led by Dr. O. Palmer Robertson, an Old Testament scholar that has been used uh, for decades here in our country and now gives himself primarily to this endeavor in Africa. Um, and uh, I've done some teaching uh, at ABU. I've been privileged to uh, preach in the chapels uh, a number of times, and uh, about three years ago, I was on the campus uh, for a few days of ministry. I was in the home of one of the professors on the campus. It's a lovely, uh, beautifully built uh, campus in Kampala, and um, while in the home of this professor, uh, a man that I've known for a long time, uh, John Wiltbank is his name. John said, uh, Randy, there's a young man on campus right now who graduated last spring from our school, and he's now ministering back uh, in the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and I'd like for you to meet him and learn a little bit about him, and you tell him about yourself. And so I agreed and went back to the man's home and was introduced to this very handsome uh, African named Upoki. And he began to tell me uh, what he was doing. He actually had uh, fled the DRC of, because of the civil violence, uh, had been a refugee for a time uh, in Uganda with his wife and a couple of children, and had been accepted by the United Nations into the refugee replacement program and had the open uh, door, the opportunity to go to Canada. He could have left Africa and uh, gone to uh, take a place among immigrants in Canada. And uh, at the point of decision, at, when he came very near decision time, found himself saying, I cannot leave. I must go back to my country. So he finished his schooling there in Kampala. 
and went back uh, to uh, the DRC. He's now attempting to plant a church uh, in his city named Bunya. And he's also evangelizing a tribe of pygmies. Uh, several hours travel from Bunya, he goes out into what he calls the forest. We would say jungle, uh, but he says the forest. He goes out uh, to where there's this small tribe, about 300 people of what are little people. Uh, pygmies are not even counted as, as part of the population in the DRC. Uh, it's almost like their humanity is denied. And um, uh, Upoki is uh, giving himself to trying to educate these people, trying to uh, help them uh, organize themselves in some uh, productive way where they can make a living for themselves. He hopes to have a medical clinic. He hopes to have a school among this tribe. And uh, so as he told me what he was doing, and then I told him what I was doing, he said, please, 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 would you come to the DRC and teach pastors? And so uh, I seek to make uh, trips into the DRC. It's, it's difficult uh, to get in. Uh, most uh, African countries, you land at the airport, uh, you get off the plane, you go inside some kind of building, you put down your passport. Uh, they check your passport. They ask for a certain number of dollars. Um, uh, it can be from $30 to $100, and you, you pay in U.S. currency, and they stamp your passport, and you go in. Well, not in the DRC. Uh, I have to go to Washington. I have to drive up to D.C. and go to the embassy of the, Dem of the Democratic Republic of Congo in D.C. and appeal to them for a visa. And uh, they have to keep my passport for several days, promising me that they will send it back to me. A couple years ago, I had done that, and one day my phone rang, and uh, this man said, are, are you Randy Pizzino? Yes, yes, that's me. Uh, do you live in Roanoke, Virginia? Yes, yes, that's where I live. Uh, well, he said, I'm holding your passport in my hand, and I live in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Well, he had applied for a visa. He and his wife were adopting a baby in the DRC, and he had sent his passport off to Washington to get it stamped so they could go get a baby. Well, my passport got sent to him, and somebody else's passport got sent to me. It was horribly confusing. But out of that confusion, out of that confusion, I got to know the man who is the head of the embassy in Washington, okay? His name is Mr. Boshanga. And now, please don't, don't take this as my being a bad man, okay? But occasionally I send Mr. Boshanga a Starbucks gift card <laughs> just to say thank you, Mr. Boshanga, for all of your cooperation in getting my passport stamped. And Mr. Boshanga has appreciated the Starbucks gift cards that he can use all over Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, it's, again, more complicated, more expensive uh, to get into the DRC, but I keep, I keep uh, going the extra steps as the Lord helps me. And God willing, my September-October trip will be all in the DRC, everything I do, um, and what will be my fourth trip of the year uh, will be uh, in three different places uh, in, the, in the DRC. Uh, let me also mention I've started a new program of bringing select men from all the groups. I've been teaching eight or nine different groups, and for over a year I've wanted to take just two or three men from each of those groups who have proven themselves uh, mature and good students, and I've wanted to bring all those men together in one place and begin to teach them at a, at a higher level. And I started that program this past September. I'll have the second effort uh, of that program in April. 
Pastor George McDearman of the Boston Lake Baptist Church was with me in September. And thank God wanted to go back again, so he'll be with me again. In April, he'll be teaching a class on hermeneutics, that is, how do you interpret the Bible. Uh, and um, a man from his church, a very gifted teacher, uh, will teach a course uh, on the church uh, in April. And uh, I will have all the chapel services that week at the African Bible University. And I'll tell you, my friends, I will be speaking on personal evangelism. So what you guys have heard this weekend, uh, a, 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 a gathering of young and spiritually hungry young people from five or six different African countries will hear, God willing, uh, at ABU, African Bible University. Uh, I leave two weeks from tomorrow uh, to go to Kenya and then to Kampala for uh, that gathering of select men, and then I'll go back to Rwanda. Uh, I do have an increased burden for, for Rwanda. Uh, so many churches being raised up, so many people making a response to the gospel, uh, so few men that are trained. Great, great need in Rwanda. Um, let me uh, let me end with two or three things about which I value your prayers. Um, please pray for my safety. Let me tell you how most Westerners now lose their lives in Africa. Most missionaries who lose their lives, who die in Africa. It doesn't happen by being captured by a tribe and put in a boiling pot, okay? You know, you have those images, right? The white person shows up, the, the tribe of people react, and they're put in a boiling pot of water. That, that's, not, that's not the way it happens. Here's how it happens. Wrecks on the highway crashes out on African highways, crashes of old buses, crashes of old automobiles, crashes of automobiles being driven by young men that don't really know how to drive. Um, it is dangerous to travel on African highways. And uh, I've been in many situations where I close my eyes <laughs> And I say, Lord, I'm not responsible for this vehicle right now. There's nothing I can do. Please keep me safe. In fact, when I was going to take my pastor with me uh, over a year ago, I was thinking, okay, now what do I want to do uh, with my pastor? And the first thing that came to my mind, I said to myself, I'm not going to put him on one of those African buses. Because I want to keep him safe and healthy to get him back to his wife and children. So I said to myself, no buses. And I carried that out. And then, and then I made a bit of a transition and I thought, well, Lord, maybe it would be okay if I thought about myself getting back safely to my wife. And uh, so I'm, I'm staying off African buses as much as I can these days. And uh, it, means, it means a little more money spent to get from point A to point B. But it's not a whole lot more money. And I think it's money well spent. But for my safety. And then, dear people, I really need wisdom in how to use money. Um, you know, I know there are missions organizations that find nationals, okay, people... Men who are ministering, preaching, pastoring in uh, countries where there's great poverty. There are missions organizations that raise money and they support those pastors. They send monthly or annual support to those pastors. Um, God may use that. Uh, but... I believe 
in East Africa, it would be a disaster. I don't think it would be wise. I'm not trying to make a blanket policy for the whole world. I'm just saying in terms of what I'm seeking to do and the places where the Lord is sending me and the people that I'm getting to know, uh, I think it would be disastrous uh, to start doing that. Because, my friends, we do not understand what money does with many people who are living in poverty. Now, we don't really know what poverty is in this country. You know, most poor people in America have an automobile. Did you know that? Most people, most poor people in America have a colored television and a house. That's not real poverty. People in Africa who live in poverty get up every morning with the question, how will I get food today? How will I feed myself? How will I feed my family? That's poverty. And I'm convinced that to start handing out money in that kind of culture will have disastrous consequences where I'm ministering. But when I go, I do take some money to give away. Not very much. I usually take four or five hundred dollars and it's, it's in my pocket to give somewhere. How? Where? Every time I step out of an airport, get through customs, get your passport stamped, go outside the airport, there's poverty. There's needy people. I could give all the money away in 15 minutes and get back on the airplane and come back home. It's overwhelming. How to use a little bit of money? Well, I will tell you, I usually pray, Lord, guide me, Lord, make my way plain, and I'll see someone here, someone there, a family here, a pastor there, and I share that. And I always say, now, the next time I come back, I may not have any money. You may have to give me money to get me home <laughs> the next time I come back. <laughs> but uh, I, I, want to, I, I want to show the love of Christ in small ways. But the wisdom to do that in a profitable way is uh, very difficult uh, to discern. Well, I think we've got a few minutes. So I told Pastor Jeremy I welcome questions about what I've said this morning. Or if someone maybe still has a question from Friday night or yesterday uh, here, uh, as we talked about personal evangelism, I'll welcome that. So anyone? Question? Yes? You have said you wanted us to pray for Jesus, and you only gave us two. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Here's the third thing. I, I, wrote, I had it jotted down. Um, pray that God will give me wisdom in selecting mature pastors here to take with me for that training program of the select leaders. Okay, the, the program where I'm bringing two or three men from each of the groups together. I hope to start doing that three, three times a year. Uh, right now, I can only see my way clear to have two sessions, but I, I hope to add a third session uh, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, but I, I need wisdom to, uh, to know uh, who to invite uh, and, and, and for men to be willing to go. It's, it's difficult for many pastors to say, to say yes, I'll, I'll be gone ten days. Uh, I think... I wish men were more ready to do that. I wish there was more of a missional mindset uh, that would make men uh, a little more responsive. But uh, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not finding a long list of volunteers, shall we say?
Okay. Yes. Could you share um, what your your teaching topics are on? Uh, you've sent and your letters you've taught on I think Romans and Timothy. And, um, could you share like to a certain amount of groups of people how many sessions you've done and, and I guess a summary of what the series are? Mm. Well, most of the conferences are three or four days. And, and what I will do, uh, usually, is uh, start around 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, a break for a meal in the middle of the day, and go up to about 4 o'clock. Uh, don't, I don't, uh, except for the classes in Kampala, where the select leaders are brought together, except for those classes, I, I don't do any teaching in the evening. Um, so it's, it's morning into late afternoon for three or four days, usually. The pattern that I've followed, I, I usually do start with First Timothy, because that's the most explicit instruction we have in the New, in the New Testament about church order and leading of the church. Um, that's why Paul wrote that book to Timothy. He says that very clearly at the end of chapter 3. So I usually start with an exposition of 1 Timothy. That usually takes me two visits. And then normally I do a, a series on sanctification, the doctrine of sanctification. And that gives me opportunity to open up what true conversion is. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open door to, to uh, go after shallow decisionism. That is rampant in Africa. What, what, what have Africans been taught about evangelism? Well, they've been taught what fundamentalists in this country have taken them. Uh, give a sermon, ask for raised hands, come to the front, pray a prayer. Boom. Decisionism. I mean, if you were the devil, you'd have a hard time finding a more effective way to deceive people about their spiritual condition. And it's rampant. So, in teaching sanctification, I have uh, extended treatment of what, what is the sanctifying process that begins the Christian life. There is a decisive sanctifying work that initiates the Christian life. And I spend a lot of time on that. And then uh, that series ends with lots of practical instruction about struggles with remaining sin. Uh, many African Christians uh, are taught uh, this, this pipe dream view of sanctification, that maybe God can do something so extraordinary in your heart after your conversion, after you've become a Christian, this second blessing of some kind, that then you really move up, well, that, that's, that's foolish, and that's not in the Bible. Uh, ongoing struggle with remaining sin is what the Christian life has to face and deal with. So, First Timothy, doctrine of sanctification. I have done some teaching in Hebrews, but usually I start expounding Romans. And um, this last time I was in Kigali, was my 11th time to be with those group, with that group of men, okay? And I finished Romans 11. So when I go back to those guys, uh, the next time I'll take up Romans 12. <laughs> the 12th visit will be. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I, uh, Debbie, after, after I finish Romans, I'm not sure what I'll do. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yes. Um, I was a little interested in hearing a little bit more about the pygmies and the progress it. of the gospel. Um, I was a little bit interested in hearing more about the pygmies and the progress uh -huh. of the gospel with them. And also um, um, curious as to why, if you know, why is there, why are they looked down upon or why are they viewed as differently as the rest of the people? Yeah. Well, let me respond to that last question first, okay? Africa is a tribal society, a tribal culture. 
what is Uganda? Uganda is a, is, is a part of Africa that Europeans carved out and named. Kenya is a part of Africa that Europeans carved out and named. It was, it was the fruit of colonization. Okay? Europeans, the Dutch, the British, the French, the Portuguese, went and colonized this vast part of the world. But, but that's an imposition. And Africans think in terms of their tribe. I have a friend named Joel Mukalu in uh, the city of Lira, which is in northern Uganda. And I remember one day saying, Joel, if I ask you, what are you, do you think I'm African, I'm Uganda, or do you think I'm Luo? And without skipping a beat, he said, I'm Luo. That's his tribe. Okay? So, in a DRC, much of the conflict, politically and even militarily, is tribally connected. And the pygmies are this, this tribe off in, the, off in the jungle that are disregarded. They're just not regarded with any dignity. It's, it's, it's really a, a result, I think, of the tribal culture. What Upoki, um, it's, it's a wonderful story. I, 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 wish I, I wish I had more time to tell you. But when Upoki first went uh, to this place to get to know this one tribe, the first thing he did was to start what he called a jerry can project. Now, y- y- you probably don't know what a jerry can is, but I'll tell you, a jerry can is a big yellow plastic jug that you carry water in. Okay? And everywhere you go in Africa, you see people carrying, sometimes you'll see a man on a bicycle with, with ten jerry cans strapped, you know, on different parts of the bike. Now, they're, they're empty. He couldn't, he couldn't have ten full jerry cans uh, on a bike, but he can carry ten empty ones off to get water somewhere. And uh, you, many times you'll see young women with a jerry can on their head uh, walking along the highway, sometimes full of water. And how young African women do that, I have no idea whatsoever. It's amazing. The Africans are just fascinating. I, 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 see, I see people do things and I think, how could a human being do that? It's amazing. Um, but the, the, these, this one tribe, these pygmies, many of them were losing their eyesight because they would go down to the river and they would wash their face when the river wasn't, wasn't settled and clear and they were getting infections from the water of the river and uh, hindering or losing eyesight. It was very sad. So Upoki started what he called the jerry can project. They didn't, these people didn't have jerry cans. And he started raising money to buy jerry cans for everybody in the tribe. And he accomplished that. And now each family has a big yellow jug where they can go down and they can, and they can get water in the, in the jerry can from the river and then leave the jerry can alone and let the stuff settle in the bottom of the jerry can. And then they've got some clean water to wash their faces. Now, you see, how many... How many of us this morning thought, oh, Lord, thank you for clean water? Anybody, anybody belt out that praise this morning? Well, the pygmies do. Okay? And uh, so he, he got to know them. He got to know them. He, he, got to have a, he built a relationship with them by this one project giving jerry cans to each family. And um, now goes there and preaches the gospel to them, tries to take some medical help occasionally, 
It, it's very difficult work, very difficult. It's slow, but, but up, Upoki, uh, Upoki is, is, um, is extraordinary. And his wife, I mean, my wife is Julie, and Upoki's wife is Juliet. <laughs> and she's a beautiful, beautiful African woman, and uh, recently gave birth um, to number six. I have African friends who stop at eight. Okay? <laughs> they stop at eight. And uh, that's, always, that's always, by the way, a point of uh, hot discussion among Africans. What about, they call it family planning. What about family planning? Well, you get, you get some heated debates among Africans when that subject comes up. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, well, well, forgive me for having a longer answer than oh, no. you might have anticipated. <laughs> well, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, thank you. And, and let, me, let me say, I am, I am deeply humbled by your, uh, by your uh, participation with me. Uh, your, your generosity, your prayers uh, means, uh, means so much to me. And... Uh, um, when I'm tempted, when I'm tempted to be lazy, uh, I can think about you guys sitting here in this room, and and the Lord, the Lord will use that to give me a kick in the behind, uh, to say, "Come on, old man, can't be lazy." Um, <laughs> and I, I need those kicks. Thank you.